This month, Salvation and Catastrophe, the Greek Turkish War 1919-1923, the Turkish Grand National Assembly opens here in Ankara in the first building. Welcome to Salvation in Catastrophe, the Greek Turkish War 1919-1923. And in this monthly episode, and I'm making an exception to make a monthly episode, we're going to talk about the events that are taking place within April 1920. As you saw in the intro video, uh, today is a very important day. 100 years ago, the Turkish Grand National Assembly conveyed in Ankara. And with the uh, creation of the Turkish Grand National Assembly, the first phase of the Greek-Turkish War, or the first phase, if you want, of what is called in Turkey the Mili Mucadele, the National Renaissance, Renaissance uh, or Restoration uh, period, comes to an end. Uh, we now have two competing centers of authority in the Ottoman Empire. One in Ankara with the Turkish Grand National Assembly, one in Istanbul under the uh, Ottoman Sultan with his cabinet with Damat Ferit Pasha. Uh, and uh, in this sense, uh, in a way, the Ottoman Empire becomes quite similar to many Latin American states and the civil wars they faced in that period, where usually you had on one side the executive, the president, versus on the other side the legislator. The classical example will be the uh, Chilean civil war of, 18, of the 1890s. I think 1891, 1893, but I might be sh wrong on that. Um, so, uh, the city of Istanbul has been occupied by the Entente. Now, officially, I mean, unofficially, it has already been occupied, but now officially, parts of the Ottoman state are closed down, especially the military and the general staff. Uh, the Sultan is going to dissolve uh, the Ottoman parliament, which had already adjured itself in uh, opposition and uh, protest against the Entente occupation. Uh, now, he has the right to dissolve the parliament, but he has to declare elections, which the Sultan is not going to do. So, in Istanbul, the Sultan is essentially ruling with the help of the Ottoman Senate, which is not an elected body, but an appointed body. Uh, the parliamentarians are going to be either arrested, for example, Rauf Orbay and Karavasif of the Karakol Society, or they are going to flee towards Ankara, where Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, in his capacity as a de facto leader of the representative committee of the Association for the Defense of Rights of Anatolia and Rumelia, is going to call for new elections for a parliament to meet there. These elections happen in April, they happen under the old Ottoman system, but they cannot apply to the whole country. Uh, and uh, they uh, sent about 300 MPs, of which 120 meet on 23rd of April and uh, convene the uh, Grand Turkish National Assembly in Ankara, which claims for itself all the legitimate executive and uh, uh, legislative power. So essentially it is uh, kind of similar with the Jacobin phase of the French Revolution, where the uh, legislative Assembly had both the executive and the, uh, leg the uh, legislative power. So, uh, de facto now we have a period of civil strife in Turkey, but as we're going to see, it is not as big as many in Greece think. Uh, and it's not always connected exactly to the uh, competition between Ankara and Istanbul as many in Turkey thinks. In many cases you have a local issue. So, let's get into the episode, let's get into the chronological order. Now, let's begin. On 1st April 1920, cough between the a coalition that included the agents of the Turkish nationalist movement, uh, the brother of Enver Pasha, the Communist Party of Azerbaijan, and the Itihad Party, and also elements of the young Turks on one side, so those are one side, and on the other side, uh, the Western nationalists of Khan Ka Koiski on the other. Azerbaijani Prime Minister Usubekov announces his resignation. On 2nd April 1920, Salih Hulusi Pasha resigns as Grand Vizier 
refusing to disown the Association for Defense of the Rights of Rumelia and Anatolia as the Entente asked him to do. On 3rd April 1920, in the Caucasus, we have the action at Askeren between Armenian rebels and Azeri forces. The Armenians are defeated. The U.S. military mission under General Harbord uh, release, uh, has its findings released by President Wilson, and this is part of his political campaign against his isolationist opponents. Uh, essentially, Harbord said that there is the potentiality to support an American mandate in Armenia, that Armenia is facing an extreme threat from East and West, uh, and uh, Wilson hopes that this will essentially put his opponents on the wall. It's not going to work. On 4th April 1920, Pyotr Rangel takes command of the white forces in Russia after Anton Deninkin resigns. Until now, Deninkin was the most powerful white Russian officer, and he was the one who came closest to essentially defeating or uh, isolating uh, the Soviet uh, reign in uh, southern Russia. Uh, the problem with the Ninkin Thu was that he was uh, very forcefully opposed to the independence of, uh, of Azerbaijan and Georgia. Uh, he was more ambivalent on Armenia. And as long as the French and the English supported the Ninkin, it was impossible for them to support the Kafkasian republics. With his resignation given up, essentially, uh, it is a clear recognition of the limits of the white movement in, the, in southern Russia and it opens up the possibility for Western support for the Kafkasian republics. On 5th April 1920, Sultan, the Sultan makes Damat Ferit Pasha again Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire. This is the second time. Now, Damat Ferit Pasha pursues an official policy of opposition to the Society of Defense of the Rights of Rumelia and Anatolia. So he is officially declaring a war, in a way, against the nationalist movement in Anatolia. This is part of his grand strategy. His grand strategy is to persuade the Entente that they are better off supporting the Sultan than relying on the Greeks for pacifying Anatolia and protecting their imperialist interests in the region. And he seeks to prove this by a policy of collaboration and accommodation. If he can show that he can keep Anatolia in peace, he hopes the Allies will temper the peace treaty and avert the loss of any territory. The Sultan himself, though, cares mainly about not losing his position in Istanbul, Constantinople. This leads to the eruption of multiple armed movements against the nationalists. Now, the nationalists call these movements uh, rebellions, insurrections. From the point of view of the Istanbul government, it is the nationalists that are in rebellion and insurrection, and it is these movements that are essentially trying to restore uh, what they think as their legal government. Now, this civil war is initially mainly fought, mainly fought in the regions around the Sea of Marmara. Uh, with the Sultanist forces mainly mobilizing Circassians, Pomaks, and Rumelian Muslims, Bosniaks, for example. Uh, a lot of these people had been uh, put in the area around the Marmara region by the Committee of Union and Progress, and before that by Abdul Hamid, uh, with the goal of weakening the very powerful Greek presence in this area. Uh, you know, this uh, whole area, roughly from Biga, from, the, from essentially the start of the Gallipoli area, all the way to essentially Bolu uh, and Zongdurlak, uh, Pondo Herakli as it's called in Greek, was a mini Ottoman Empire and that it was, it was highly ethnically fragmented. You had multiple ethnic groups present. Um, there had been conflicts starting ever since 1900s as Muslim refugees arrived in and come into conflict with the local Muslims or the local Greeks. During the 1914-1918 period, there had been uh, large-scale uh, uh, pogroms, massacres and uh, deportations of Ottoman Greeks, for example, the big Ottoman Greek uh, population of Gallipoli was either massacred or expelled from the Ottoman Empire under the 1914 Ottoman uh, census. Gallipoli was essentially heavily Greekified, some of the north southern part. Uh, others of them were uh, deported. Uh, so, in general, this whole area is uh, very fragmented and it's important because it's very close to Istanbul, Constantinople, and whoever controls the Marmara region. And we're going to have a special episode on geography, I promise to you, some point within this month or next month. Whoever controls the Marmara region controls both the Bandirma, Panormos, uh, essentially Zmirna railway line, 
and also can control the terminus of the Baghdad railway and the railway going to Ankara. So it's a very strategically important uh, area. Now, the centers of activity were along the Badrima Panamos Balikeshi railway line, where Ahmed Anzavur was active, he was a Caucasian. And the region essentially uh, stretching from Izmit, Nicomedia, east to Duzje and Bolu, and south to Bilejik, essentially the upper uh, valley of the Sakaria Sangarius River. Uh, now, uh, on 6 April 1920, Mustafa Kemal Pasha arranges for the creation of the Anatolian Agency, Anadolu Agency, which will be a press agency whose goal was to propagandize the position of the Society for Defense of the Rights of Rumelia and Anatolia in the whole world. The main agents were Khalidep Edip Adivar and Yunus Nadi, which, like many nationalist Turks, were fleeing from Istanbul to go to Ankara. Between 9th and 11th April 1920, the councils of the League of Nations meet to consider the Armenian issue. Venizelos promised to contribute forces to a potential great power military expedition to support Armenia. The League decides not to take on the responsibility of a mandate and passes the issue back to the Supreme Council, which is essentially, uh, at this point, England, France and Italy. Meanwhile, the Armenians counterattack the Azeris at Karabakh. Between 9 and 14 April 1920, we have the last conference of the three Trans-Kafkasian republics that attempt to resolve their existing issues. The conference fails. On 10 April 1920, the London conference ends where there were important discussions about the Eastern issue and the peace treaty that will be done with the Ottoman Empire. And the three decide to meet at San Remo uh, to continue the discussions. On 11 April 1920, Sultan Mehmed VI Vaheddin officially dissolves the Ottoman Parliament, which, as I pointed out, had adjourned since the occupation. No elections were called, the non-elected Senate continued to function. The same day, a fatwa is issued by the Seyhu Lishlam, the uh, official leader of Islam, who, that's not a proper term, he's not the leader of Islam, he's more like the Sultan's official spokesperson, that declared the nationalists infidels and permitted their killing. Starting from 13 April 1920 and going all the way to 31st May 1920, we have the first Duzce insurrection against the Turkish nationalist movement. Mustafa Kemal attributes their activity to the Collaborationist Society for Revival of Islam. The forces of the Sultanists are mostly Circassians. Lord George decides to avoid UK engagement with the Kurdish issue. And Dro Kanyan takes command of Armenian forces in Karabakh. So this is important to understand that despite all the talk about support for the Kurds, Lloyd George himself did not believe that anything could be uh, really uh, attained there because the Kurdish tribes were divided, Kurds in Mesopotamia were rebelling against the British, Kurds in Anatolia were rebelling against the Ottoman government or the nationalist Turkish forces or essentially fighting each other or fighting uh, Assyrians and whatever was left of the Armenians, which was not a lot. So, you know, unlike the Ottoman Greeks and the Ottoman Armenians, there was no clear Kurdish national ideal yet that had massive popular support. Between 13th and 24th of April 1920, you have an unsuccessful Trafkaskassian Republic discussions about Batum. Armenia is trying to discuss with uh, Georgia about what to do with Batum, what rights would Armenia of, tra uh, of transport have, and so on. Because until this point, the Georgian essentially used their control of the area around Batum to control the kind of external help that arrives to Armenia. Okay, and they use it to extort the Armenians to give up on the lower issue and other issues. On 10th April 1920. The United Opposition in Greece makes its official first debut with a manifesto of the 16th in the press. They demand immediate elections. Key instigator of this movement for unifying the various anti venizelist Constantinist opposition groups was Nikolaos Stratos of the Conservative Party, who was an ex-Venizelist. He found cooperation with Panayotis Tsaldares from the National Free Thinkers Party of exiled Dimitrios Gunaris, who was one of the central Constantinist politicians, and Nikolaos Kalogeropoulos, who is an ex-Theotokist politician. Only Dimitrios Rallis under trial and Nikolaos Dimitrakopoulos of the Progressive Party do not take part. Stratos had sought to sideline Gunaris. He was a very ambitious man, but uh, generally speaking, his grasping ambition made him few friends. 
and he failed to move Chaldaris and the other members of the National Thinkers Party to defect from Gunaris to something led by Stratos. Now, Gunaris himself, who was in exile, was obsessively focused on attacking Venizelos as a tyrant and the restoration of King Constantine. He was confident that an overwhelming popular support for a Constantinist restoration would force the major powers to accommodate the new Constantinist Greeks. He did not believe that this would weaken the Greek position in Asia Minor, as he believed that the Greek position was the result of systemic and structural forces driving to the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, rather than the specific policy decisions of Eleftherios Venizelos. Another name, he argued that even if Venizelos was not there, Greece would still attain the things that Venizelos got. He thus sought a policy of a fight to the finish. Indeed, he would have preferred a violent overthrow of Venizelos rather than elections. On 16th April 1920, forces under Kirkassian at him, Cherkes at him, loyal to the representative committee, defeat the dis and disperse the Kirkassian Pomak forces of Anzavur and Gavur Imam in the area around Balikeshir, south of the Marmara, uh, Marmara Sea. The second Anzavur rebellion comes to an end. An earlier attempt by Major Ahmi Mufreze C with about 1,350 men, 1,350 men, three guns and 16 machine guns had failed to defeat the Sultanists. In Ankara, a college of muftis and Islamic scholars issued a fatwa that declared the Caliph a prisoner of the infidels and called on the people to rise against the foreign powers and to liberate him. So, uh, Ankara follows a policy that is very classically 18th, 17th century European. Uh, you were not supposed to rebel against the king, you were supposed to rebel against the bad uh, counselors of the king. So there's a classical book of uh, history about this called uh, His Majesty's Rebels. Uh, so it's kind of similar in that, that officially Ankara, the a representative committee does not declare the Sultan at end, it does not declare the Sultan as a traitor to the unofficial positions of the press, especially attack the Sultan many times, but instead say that the Sultan is a prisoner of foreign powers and he has to be liberated. Between 18th of April and 25th of July of 1920, there is fighting between forces loyal to the National Pact and the Ottoman Caliphate Disciplinary Army. The force, these forces were supported by the Duzje and Anzavur forces. On April 18th, there is an Azeri-Armenian ceasefire. The Damat Ferit cabinet gets permission by the British to create a weak division-sized force called the Disciplinary Forces Kuvai in Zibatiye, also known as the Army of the Caliphate to use against the Nationalists. Now, this force is technically a division, so it is a military force. Uh, a military formation made up of three regiments plus an artillery regiment and technically of full strength an Ottoman division would be about 12,000 men, 3,000 men in each of the uh, infantry regiments and about 2,000 men in the artillery regiment. Uh, but the Allies are not willing the to permit the Sultan to actually build a full division. Instead, uh, it's a half division kept at demobilization status, so it only puts to the field about 3,000 to 4,000 men which is about as much as any of the nationalist divisions put. Between 19th and 26th of April 1920, we have the San Remo Conference among the major powers. A significant reduction of the territory that will be awarded to Armenia was decided, and there was a decision not to send troops to assist Armenia in any form, only logistical support. The Armenians are thus on their own. Defeating Curzon, Lloyd George engineers the decision to call on President Wilson to draw the Armenian borders. Venizelos is able to gain a promise of the cession of Eastern Thrace and Izmir Smyrna to Greece. This had come after a period following the Inter-Allied Commission report about the events of May and uh, June 1919, where Venizelos had started to fear that Greece would be forced to withdraw from Izmir Smyrna. He believed that what had happened, the massacres, the incidents, had so damaged the Greek position that it was very likely that in the final peace treaty, Izmir Smyrna will be returned to the Ottoman Empire under some kind of autonomy regime, but without the presence of the Greek army. Now, he avoided this, but in return, he had to promise to take the weight of defeating the forces in the Ottoman Empire of post the Antan. Venizelos had to essentially say that, I will impose your treaty. It is at this point, as Sotiriu Didu argues, that the Greek national goal of liberation and unification with the Greeks of Asia Minor 
And I have to remind you that according to the Ottoman census of 1914, there were areas of the Ottoman Empire that had Greek majorities. For example, the Chesme Peninsula is tied to the power politics and imperialist goals of the major powers. The subjugation of Turkey beyond the zone of Greek claims becomes a necessary part of the goal for unification of Ottoman Greeks with Greece. Whether Greece likes it or not, it has now become a proxy and a servant of the greater imperialist goals of the Ottoman Empire, and the success of Greece necessitates the subjugation of Turkey to foreign rule. On 22nd April 1920, we have the 9th Assembly of Karabakh Armenians that authorizes Draw to fight on their behalf. After the resignation of Uzadekov, a new Musavat government under Mehmet Hadjinsky fails to form. Now, the Musavat were the majority uh, political movement in what was called in the past Tatarstan, so today Azerbaijan. They were uh, left-wing nationalists. Uh, and they had been in power the most dominant group, but slowly, slowly their power has been eroded by the situation in the Caucasus, by the rebellion of the Armenians in Karabakh and so on. Now, there are calls for a Musavat dictatorship and, and essentially establishing a military uh, extraordinary regime. And these are met by calls for a Soviet regime. Okay? Meanwhile, in uh, Anatolia, Konolel Mahmoud Nedim Hendek is killed in action against the first Dushje insurrection. He is the first Turkish division commander, division of the 24th division in this case, to be killed in the war. The 24th division is essentially disso dissolved by the rebels. It's a major defeat for the nationalist forces. But you have to remember that when we're talking about divisions here, we're not meaning fully mobilized divisions. We're, morning, we're essentially meaning divisions that are the size of a regiment, so about 3,000 men. On 23rd April 1920, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, TGNA, henceforth, convenes in Ankara, in the old Committee of Union and Progress Club building. It declares itself the only legal authority in the Ottoman Empire. Of the 300 delegates elected, only 120 are able to make it to the meeting, to the opening. The U.S. grants de facto recognition to Armenia, but not de jure. On 24th April 1920, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk is voted as Speaker of the Turkish Grand National Assembly. This made him de facto also the head of the government, the so-called Committee of Executive Commissioners. Ijra Vekileri Hegeti. Meanwhile, in Europe, a major event happens as the Soviet-Polish war begins. As a result of this war, the Soviet drive into the Caucasus and the Soviet drive against the forces of the White Russians in the Crimea, Odessa region is going to come to an end as massive Soviet troops are rerouted to go and fight the Poles in a war on which a lot hinges. The Kraku communists are orders from Kirov and Kavburo, the Kafkasian uh, bureau of the Bolshevik Party, party form a revolutionary committee called Revkom. I, I just love this Bolshevik nomenclature. Come on, Kavburo, Revkom. It's really cool. Khalil Pasha and the other agents of the Turkish Grand National Assembly work in cooperation with the Revkom with the goal of essentially Sovietizing uh, Azerbaijan as a first path to essentially destroying the Armenian Republic and making the borders. Uh, between uh, uh, the Soviet-controlled areas and the Turkish Grand National Assembly corridor areas common. On 26 April 1920, the Soviet 11th Army crosses into Azerbaijan. Mustafa Kemal Pasha, as president of the Turkish Grand National Assembly, officially initiates discussions with the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic, calling on the Soviets to overthrow Georgia, and promising that the Turkish Grand National Assembly would overthrow Armenia and guarantee the Sovietization of Azerbaijan. He also requested money and military supplies. Just as the Greeks, in order to attain their national goals, are essentially agreeing to become the tools of subjugation and colonization and uh, occupation of all of Anatolia in the name of the great powers, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, in pursuit of the Turkish national idea, has now willingly become part of the imperialist uh, expansion of the Soviet uh, regime into the Caucasus and the destruction of the indebted states of Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan. 
for Turkey to survive, Armenians, Georgians and Azeris must come under the rule of the Soviets. On 27th of April 1920, Fevzi Chakmak Pasha, many times Minister of War and General Chief of Staff and one of the most senior Ottoman officers, very prestigious, arrives in Ankara. His arrival is a major victory for the Turkish Grand National Assembly, as his prestige will lead to many officers deciding to join the Turkish Grand National Assembly. Importantly, his arrival also means that Ismet Inonu now will become the Chief of Staff of the uh, Army of the Turkish Grand National Assembly. He, uh, this decision of Mustafa Kemal Pasha was resisted by Ali Fuad Chebeshoy, according to Mustafa Kemal Pasha and Refet Dele, both of whom considered that they had more seniority than Inonu and that uh, there had been in Anatolia much more than Inonu, so they believed they should, one of the two of them should be the chief of staff. But Mustafa Kemal Pasha, with the support and advice of Fevzi Chakmak, decided to make Inonu as chief of staff. There's a reason for this. Inonu had commanded a corps under Mustafa Kemal Pasha during uh, World War I in the Mesopotamian front, uh, when Mustafa Kemal Pasha was the leader uh, of the Yildirim army group. Uh, so they knew each other as military officers and generally speaking, Inonu had a lot of command experience. You have to remember, Efet Bele had spent most of his time in the Gendarmerie, and I'll be frank, I don't remember what Ali Fouad Chebeshoi did in the First World War right now, which tells you a lot. Between 27th and 29th April 1920, the general fighting between Armenian and Azeris peters out as the Red Army enters Baku at the behest of a revolutionary Bolshevik government under the Revkom. The Azeri parliament capitulates to the Communist Party of Azerbaijan, which is supported by the Turkish-influenced Itihadist Party and the left wing of the Musavat Party. The Azerbaijani Socialist Soviet Republic is declared and the Soviet power is now established in the Caucasus for the first time since 1917. On 29th April 1920, the Turkish Grand National Assembly passes a Dragonian treason law prescribing death, prescribing death, the death penalty for its opponents. The biggest victims of this law will end up being the political and communal leadership of the Pontic Greeks, Karadeniz Rum, but much later in 1921. Finally, Starting with 30th April 1920 and going all the way to 29th June 1920, the Armenian Republic sends the Shant mission to Moscow. The goal is to attain a treaty. The Armenians are understanding that their position is becoming worse, as on the one hand, the foreign the great powers are not willing to support Armenia in any substantive way. On the other hand, Azerbaijan has just become Soviet, so the Soviet army is breathing down the throats of Armenia and finally, the Turkish Grand National Assembly is uh, formed in Ankara and it officially is considered a deadly enemy to the Armenians. So everywhere the Armenians have enemies except from Georgia, which essentially loves extorting Armenia uh, and will only help Armenia if Armenia essentially submits to all of Georgian territorial demands. The Armenians fail to get what they want and the Soviets tell them that from now on any discussion will be at Erevan. So that's where we are in April 1920, a pivotal date in the history of this war. We now have the start of the Turkish nationalist idea with the Turkish Grand National Assembly that essentially declares the people as the sovereign uh, party. We have localized civil war, mostly in the regions around the Marmara Sea uh, and close to Istanbul. Uh, we have the start of the fall of the Caucasian barrier in the east and we have in Greece, the promise of great gains, but only for a return to great effort. Now, the next episode is going to be again a three-month episode covering the events of May, June, July, and it's going to be out in July, but some point in the middle, I probably will make a geography episode, since it's about time that we start understanding the geography of this vast, vast battlefield that is Anatolia. My sources for these episodes are Andrew Mango Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal Pasha Ataturk, and who took the great speech in the excellent Ish Bankasi edition. Buy this one if you want to read in English. Nothing else. This is the one. Stefano Sioan, Stefano Eleftheri Venezuela, the document of the documents of Eleftheri Venezuela, volume 2. Richard J. Hovhannisian, the Republic of Armenia, volume 2. You have to understand whether you like it or not, whether you like Hovhannisian or not. His four volume book is the best. English source about what is going on in the Caucasus. And Hovhannisian reads Turkish, so he has also used heavily Turkish sources. Uh, for example, 
Most of Kazim Karabekis uh, are independence war uh, in English can only be found in Hovhannisian since it was never translated. Uh, Mariana Christopoulou, Dimitrius Hunaris, a biography of Dimitrius Hunaris, this will become much more important as time passes. Finally, the Dosotiriu, the Strategie to Imperialism in Anatolic Mesopotamia, the Strategy of Imperialism in Eastern uh, Mediterranean, which is a pamphlet created by the Marxist uh, uh, refugee Dido Sotiriu, Anatolian Greek refugee Dido Sotiriu, which is essentially a brief uh, recapitulation of the positions of the Communist Party of Greece and various Marxist uh, groups. So that's it. Enjoy in Turkey the 23rd of April. Uh, the rest of my friends, please take care of yourself. Stay safe. We're going to get through this whole weird COVID paradigm situation. Uh, and I'll see you all hopefully some point this month or next month.